Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology Podcasts with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used, or just around the corner, from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Coming to Dallas, Texas, September 14th, 15th, and 16th, 2018, the Blockchain and Future Tech Expo. This is going to be a gigantic conference of over 5,000 people. We're going to be talking about blockchain and its applications. We're going to be talking about quantum computing, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and several other future technologies that are poised to and actually changing our lives as we speak. Here's why you should attend. As you may know, early adopters are the ones that investigated and profited from things like the gold rush in the 1800s, from the dot-com boom in the 1990s, from the internet boom in 2005, from the smartphone explosion in 2007, from the real estate boom that ended in 2008, and of course, from the Bitcoin boom that started in 2012. Early adopters act now. They don't wait till later. They go out west first in their covered wagons. They find the biggest gold nuggets. If you consider yourself an early adopter and you want to find the biggest nuggets, then you owe it to yourself to attend this upcoming conference. Blockchain is going to affect how we control and store our medical data, how we send money around the world, how we bank, and more. But artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and cybersecurity will play a pivotal role in our lives as well. And that's why our next event, September 14th to the 16th at the Dallas Convention Center, is going to have not only 5,000 plus attendees, but we'll showcase blockchain, AI, cybersecurity, quantum computing, and more. You want to get in on the coming gold rush of future tech and opportunity as an early adopter. Don't be left out. To register, go to bftexpo.com. That's blockchainfuturetechexpo.com. Thank you. Welcome to the Future Tech Podcast. Uh, I'm Alan Thomas, and I'm joined here today with Damian Scott, COO of Renovo. Hey, Damian. Hey, Alan. Uh, great to speak with you. Uh, uh, so, well, let's uh, get right into it. Uh, what is Renovo and what do you guys do? Yeah, sure. So, um, Renovo is an um, automotive technology company. Um, we're based in um, Campbell in the Silicon Valley area. I mean, we build an operating system for automotive mobilers. Um, that's really a set of services and technology that allow highly automated vehicles to um, integrate a range of different pieces of software and technology that really come together to enable the provision of a, a true automotive mobility service. Ah, so so you specifically so you specifically focus on autonomous driving then? Yeah, that's right. And I think um, even more specific than that, I think that there are really two different paths um, that autonomous driving um, is taking. One is this incremental improvement to individually owned vehicles that you or I could buy. Um, so we've sort of seen this with a lot of brands that have um, lane keeping assist and adaptive cruise control. And those systems are getting better and, and, and more capable. But the focus of, of, of the Renovo is really on the, the step change um, that automation brings about in mobility on demand. So um, you can think of uh, companies like Uber and Lyft that don't require that you own a vehicle, and when you need a ride, you just pull out your smartphone and um, hopefully a vehicle shows up relatively soon and uh, takes you where you're going. Um, and, and that's really a very different um, application of uh, autonomy, where you're removing a driver, um, and so the cost goes down substantially, but those, those vehicles are going to be used um, a lot. And that's really the, the market that... Um, we're focused on it with Nova, and we're, we're building technology to enable. Ah, okay. And and how did, how did you personally get into like how did you personally get into this? What's your your background? How did you kind of come to this point? Um, yeah. So I um have a slightly uh, uh complex and, and, and long background. I actually was uh, born in, in in New Zealand, grew up in a pretty remote part of Botswana, um, went to undergrad in Australia, lived and worked in the UK for a while, um, and I was in the Middle East. Um, but throughout all of that, I've had a, um, a really strong fascination with um, transportation. And um, I spent almost seven years working for a Formula One racing team 
um, called Williams, which is based out of the United Kingdom. And um, my role there was to really look at all of the things that we did um, well in the racing domain and transfer those out to a range of other industries, the automotive industry, mining, um, uh, public transport. And so that gave me an amazing um, view into how a range of different industries and companies are sort of thinking about these um, disruptive changes coming, electrification, automation, different business models. Um, and uh, my, my sort of fascination with these, these macro changes that were happening um, really grew. And um, I think like a lot of people around the world, um, the, the sort of magnetism of Silicon Valley um, was too strong to resist. And so I came out here and um, met the, uh, pretty early on met the, um, the co-founders of Renovo um, through a mutual uh, connection, a former um, a key engineering member of Tesla. And um, we just got on really well and um, started working with them and um, uh, a little over a year ago joined the team um, full time. Okay, and the and I just wanted to make sure to ask you this in terms of the the near future or or the next couple of years of your industry. What does that what does that look like for you, or or, or what's your opinion on where it may go? Yeah, I mean, this is sort of the the multi billion dollar, potentially trillion dollar question is is timing for um, for how the industry is going to change. Um, you know, we we see um, as I was saying before, there's sort of two parts, and we we see a lot of um, really interesting innovations happening in the traditional automotive industry with increasing levels of automation coming to vehicles. Um, Tesla's um, clearly the most prominent with its, its autopilot feature. Um, but you've got things like GM um, deploying you know, very capable systems in their Super Cruise, in, in their Cadillac, and from the, the German OEMs, um, Mercedes, and, and so forth. So I think those are going to get better and better over time. And I think you know, it's um, potentially a uh, uh, benefit for, for customers and, and, and general safety as well. But I think that you know, in, in our sector, the, the, the key question is, when do we start to see these automated mobility services or, or robo-taxis actually available. So in a city in the US, when can you pull out your smartphone, summon a vehicle, and it arrives without a driver in it, it authenticates you, you get into that vehicle, and it takes you to where you want to go. And I think that's a very um, important milestone that, that we need to hit as an industry. Um, I think our expectation is that um, uh, companies like Waymo are probably going to be there first. Um, the California DMV has um, updated its um, autonomous vehicle regulations, um, and it is now possible to apply for a permit to operate vehicles on public roads here in California without a human safety driver supervising the vehicle and taking commercial passengers. Um, so that regulation came into effect um, at the beginning of this month. Um, I believe that two companies have applied um, for that permit. One of those um, is Waymo. And so it would appear that some at some point in 2018, possibly early 2019, um, uh, some companies will begin to offer those services. And that will be really a turning point. And so we're really excited about, um, about that happening um, at, at Renova. I think that marks the, um, the beginning of the, the true commercialization and realizing the potential of um, this automated mobility sector. Now, now, do you think that uh, in terms of widespread use, like you said, someone steps out of the door, they they open up an app on their phone, and a car literally just kind of drives up for them. Do you think in terms of widespread use like that, that there'll be a need for a separate, I guess, marketing campaign in order to really get um, the, the bulk of the public on board? Or do you think there'll be enough early adopters to where that would just kind of convince people just – on its own. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's unclear um, if we use, you know, the rise of ride hailing services like um, Uber and Lyft here in, in the U.S., Get Grab, um, BD in, in Asia and other parts of the world. Um, I think a lot of that has just been word of mouth that, you know, you rewind to before um, Uber and Lyft start going. The idea that you get into a private person's vehicle after they arrive with smartphone was pretty alien and, and, and frankly a little bit scary to, to a lot of people. But I think, you know, when your friends do it and they say, hey, this is really great, it's, it's convenient, you don't have to um, you know, worry about hailing taxis and they just show up. 
And often, you know, the first experience that people had with a, a ride-hit vehicle was a colleague or family member or something who, who showed them. And so I think it's going to be probably quite similar with um, these automated vehicles that you hail on demand. And again, to just you know, underscore this distinction between an individually owned vehicle and a ride that you summon, um, if you wanted to go out and, and buy a, you know, um, a highly capable autonomous vehicle, um, let's say Mercedes S-Class or, or a Tesla with autopilot, that's a significant decision about financing or purchasing that vehicle. Whereas if you just want to take a ride, um, you know, a couple of blocks in the city, and you're interested in understanding what this, this new automated mobility service is like, that may be a you know, four or five dollar um, commitment. And so the the um, the barrier to people trying these services is so low when it's on demand that very quickly, um, if it is better and it's cheaper, um, the adoption can be dramatic. Um, and so if you think about the average life of of, of a vehicle in the U.S., um, it's over 10 years. And so that means that depending on what type of a, a consumer of vehicles you are, you may need to wait multiple years before, if you typically buy a, a pre-owned vehicle, you know, three or four years um, into its life, um, you may wait, have to wait until um, uh, that technology is kind of cascaded down. Whereas with this automated mobility on demand, um, that is available to everyone instantly at a very low cost. So I think it's going to be it's going to be really interesting to watch the, the adoption of that. And what, one other thing I would just add is is um, I think like most things in life, uh, economics and incentives tend to ultimately dominate um, uh, customer behavior. And so today, the average for a, a rise hail um, journey. Um, using Uber or Lyft in the U.S., about two dollars per mile. Um, the average cost all in when you take into account financing, depreciation, fuel, insurance, licensing, so forth, to operate a vehicle that you own, a sort of mid-range um, uh, something like a Toyota Camry, um, is about you know seventy to eighty cents per mile. So a lot of people are choosing not to buy a car particularly in cities, choosing to use services like Uber and Lyft and others, um, even though they're more than double the cost per mile of owning a vehicle individually. And so the promise of, of automating that is you take the cost of the driver out of it, which is you know anywhere from 50 to 70% of what you're paying. And now all of a sudden, the cost per mile um, goes well below what it costs to own and operate your own vehicle. And it's more convenient because you don't have to look for parking. And there isn't this big upfront purchasing or financing decision and you're locked into now having this expensive asset that you have to maintain. So I think that transition is a really, really interesting inflection point. And provided that there are enough of these vehicles and that the initial operators price them according to where they think the steady state cost to them is going to be, I think we could see incredibly rapid adoption and, and people, particularly in, in early adopting cities, um, shift how they think about moving around pretty dramatically. And so there would definitely be a shift upward in productivity, too, if you think about it, because uh, especially in larger cities, because like you said, it gets to the point where, you know, if you, you're not having to actively drive, you could get so much more done if you have an hour commute to work and back. So I could definitely see what you're talking about in terms of affecting day-to-day -day life. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think if you if you could claim that time back, um, you think of the billions of hours that um, that we all spend behind the wheel performing um, a function that isn't necessarily additive to our life. I think for a lot of people, um, you know, being stuck in uh, a highway in traffic is not particularly enjoyable. You know, maybe it's possible to listen to some audio books or, or, or great uh, podcasts like yours. Um, but it, it would be it would be even better if you could have that time to uh, to really choose to use flexibly. Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm personally I'm looking forward to that particular part of it. <laughs> I cannot wait, but um, because I'm in a large metro area myself. But um, exactly. Yeah, but in, now 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 we've talked now and and like you said, we see this kind of coming up on the horizon. So that's pretty. That's a pretty realistic development. What uh, what kind of developments have kind of been thrown out thrown out there that seem like they're a little bit too ambitious for right now? Like like you hear an idea or a concept and you say, well, 
that sounds like something that's decades away or 20, 30 years away. Yeah, so I think, I think um, specifically in, in the field of, of automating road going vehicles, um, the idea that you could buy a vehicle that you own and you get into it and you hit the destination um, and that can be anywhere in continental United States. And with that vehicle, you can go to sleep in the back and it will be able to traverse all the different road conditions, potentially go through blizzards and icy roads and places where there's no connectivity. I think that vision is a very, very long way away. There are so many complicated edge cases and very specific things that you really need you know, the experience of 18 years of life as a human being to kind of figure out how to you know, operate a vehicle to get through them. And that's quite a hard thing to build into an automated driving system. And so I think, you know, it's, it's another reason why at, at Lenovo we're so excited about this on-demand model, because if you're just operating initially in a very constrained geographic area in a major city, you can understand the, the physical environment very, very precisely and, and map it incredibly accurately, characterize the, the dynamic object. So how do the pedestrians typically behave at a certain junction? What do cyclists do in that? And you can operate those vehicles you know, safely and efficiently. That happens many, many years before um, a vehicle can handle all possible driving conditions. And so I think, um, you know, people get excited about, about autonomous vehicles and have this, this um, it's a wonderful vision that you just kind of get into your car and, you know, should you want to, you could kind of go from LA to New York and just go to sleep in the back and, and the car will take care of everything. I think that's a long way away. <laughs> but it is a, uh, yeah, because I was going to say that that, uh, that is a nice thought to have. I know, I know a lot of people, they, they seem to want to jump to that particular version of it when they're talking about it first, you know, when they're kind of fantasizing about that. Like you said, you can traverse all road conditions. You're just kind of like you said, taking a nap until you get there. But um, and 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 let me ask you too. This would uh, and this would all also extend to commercial driving as well, correct? In terms of um, trucks going um, coast to coast and taking supplies and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Um, the I think there's a, there's a very different set of constraints and, and potential benefits depending on the exact use case. Um, so I think. Um, you know, inter- interstate trucking, there are a number of companies that are, are looking at that and looking at the safety and economic benefits of automation. Um, but I think the, 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 the real benefit is in cities where you've got this uh, issue of parking, you've got issues of, of congestion, and so a, a better system to, to sort of move people around um, is really where a lot of those benefits um, accrue. Technically, it's, as you can imagine, a lot more challenging to create a system that is safe, reliable, and efficient to operate in city environments, which tend to be a lot more chaotic in terms of the the, the, the road conditions, the number of pedestrians, cyclists, and, and, and other things, versus um, driving on a highway. You know, highways tend to have good visibility, lane markings, and that sort of thing. And so I think you know some some companies in in, in the sector are also focusing on solving the highway driving problem, and others are focused on the the, the more chaotic urban environment. Okay, and and would you say that uh, Renovo is definitely the, the 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 biggest player in the space, or or is there a, or I guess is there a, a unique slant on it that you guys have versus the any other organizations that are working towards it? Yeah, so we we definitely not the biggest biggest player in the space. There are some um, I, I don't know what the right now is the whales or or um, very 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 big uh, animals that are that are, are all um, you know taking a, a slightly different approach to this. Um, so our thesis at Renovo is um, we don't build the automated driving system, the autonomous brain that is is doing you know what you or I do when we're behind the wheel of a car today. And we don't build that, but we we create a layer um, that allows different types of automated driving systems to easily be integrated with different types of vehicles and also for a range of different services that are not directly contributing to the driving function, but become necessary once you take the driver out of the vehicle in these automated mobility um, situations. Um, And so... uh, you know, we, we 
take a very Silicon Valley view to this, but um, you look at the history of computing, of smartphones, scale innovation with these platforms really happens not when you've got one company that does everything from building a vehicle to building a self-driving system to building an app that hails that vehicle, running the fleet, doing the maintenance, doing the operation. Where scale and innovation happens is when you, when you break that apart and you have best-in-class technology operating at every level. And so what Renova does is we are the sort of plumbing or the glue that allow those things to fit together so that innovation can happen. You know, no analogy is, is, is perfect, but um, if you think back to what Microsoft Windows did for the emergence of the personal computer, they didn't make um, most of the, the applications but they created a consistent interface for many tens of thousands of large and small companies to write Windows applications and then know that those could run on a range of different um, types of hardware. Um, the same is true with um, what Android did for smartphones. So you know, um, a significant majority of, of smartphones around the world use Android or some variant of Android, and that allows um, companies big and small that are creating things that add value to those users um, to do that one. You've obviously got iOS as well, but you've got these sort of 2D ecosystems. And if, if you just imagine if, if every um, smartphone company had its own operating system and its own suite of services and its own um, applications, from calendaring to photo sharing, you just wouldn't see that interoperable um, innovation. And so our, I think what where, where Renovo is different is, is we view this sort of future vehicle platform as something that should be open, interoperable, and that it should foster innovation for technologies and services and allow those to be um, uh, configured in a range of different ways to meet specific requirements in different cities or different operating models. And so I think we, we're somewhat unique in, in, in taking that view um, and uh, really trying to be the, the, sort of the plumbers of, of automated mobility. So, so so I guess it'd be fair to say that Renovo really kind of provides the platform or foundation that can be built upon in the space. Others can kind of build upon what you're what you're doing in this space. Yeah, that, that that's exactly right. So we we enable um, a range of different third party companies in our ecosystem to to do what they do really well um, because there are a lot of hard technical problems that need to be solved, and I think it's um, unlikely that any single company does all of those really well. And when you bring together um, a lot of different um, technology nodes in an environment which is safety critical, these are you know um, uh, one two ton pieces of metal that are being controlled by computers. Um, that needs to be done in in a safe um, and reliable manner, and and that's really where we excel as a company. Okay, that's great. And Damien, one last question for you: just if for anyone who is interested in finding out more about Renovo, wants to connect with you or the company itself, what's the best way to get in touch with you guys? Yeah, so I think um, we're on all the, uh, the social media channels. So um, take a look at um, Renovo's website, Renovo.auto. Um, we're on Twitter at Renovo underscore auto, Medium um, and uh, LinkedIn. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch with me, um, you can find me, um, Damien Scott, on uh, LinkedIn. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, Damien, for coming in and speaking to us, and, and, and we appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Coming to Dallas, Texas, September 14th, 15th, and 16th, 2018, the Blockchain and Future Tech Expo. This is going to be a gigantic conference of over 5,000 people. We're going to be talking about blockchain and its applications. We're going to be talking about quantum computing, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and several other future technologies that are poised to and actually changing our lives as we speak. Here's why you should attend. As you may know, early adopters are the ones that investigated and profited from things like the gold rush in the 1800s, from the dot-com boom in the 1990s, from the internet boom in 2005, from the smartphone explosion in 2007, from the real estate boom that ended in 2008, and of course, from the Bitcoin boom that started in 2012. Early adopters act now. They don't wait till later. They go out west first in their covered wagons. They find the biggest gold nuggets. If you consider yourself an early adopter and you want to find the biggest nuggets, 
then you owe it to yourself to attend this upcoming conference. Blockchain is going to affect how we control and store our medical data, how we send money around the world, how we bank, and more. But artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and cybersecurity will play a pivotal role in our lives as well. And that's why our next event, September 14th to the 16th at the Dallas Convention Center, is going to have not only 5,000 plus attendees, but will showcase blockchain, AI, cybersecurity, quantum computing, and more. You want to get in on the coming gold rush of future tech and opportunity as an early adopter. Don't be left out. To register, go to bftexpo.com. That's blockchainfuturetechexpo.com. Thank you. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.